Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Wednesday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds. My name is Amanda Duran, and I'm the program coordinator for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. Before we get started with today's webinar, I just wanted to remind everyone that today's webinar will be um, recorded and posted online at obcinet.org slash lunchwiththebirds, as well as on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash obci1. At the bottom of your screen, you can see a list of some of our past archived webinars um, on a range of topics that are available right now um, at our YouTube channel. And although our series will be taking a break next month in May, um, we will have some really exciting upcoming topics in June, July, and August that I'd like to share with you. In June, our topic will be nesting birds in the oak openings. In July, our topic will be outdoor recreation to benefit birds. And in August, our speaker will talk on bird conservation and agriculture. So I hope that you'll come back and join us for those presentations in the coming months. And with that, I would like to introduce today's spe speaker, Casey Tucker. Casey will be graduating from Miami University in May with a master's degree in biology with an emphasis on inquiry-driven education and bird conservation. He is an adjunct part-time instructor of environmental and life sciences for Central Ohio Technical College. Casey also organizes the annual Ohio Avian Research Conference, which is held each October here in Ohio. Um, for more information on that conference, or if you're interested, you can contact him at tuckercasey at hotmail.com. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Casey. So today, the title of my talk is Good Burgers Wear Whatever They Want, and that's based on a, a book that came out a few years ago called Good Burgers Wear White. Um, and after having read that, I realized that we need to have a better understanding of how birds see the world. We, we oftentimes um, anthropomorphize or, or um, interpret what birds see based on our own way of seeing the world. Um, but I think if once you have an understanding of how birds see the world, you kind of see things from a different perspective. So there are a couple things I'm going to talk about. First are the properties of light and light detection. And this is going to get into physics and philosophy, which neither of those I'm very good at. So this will be a, a rather interesting aspect. Um, <clears throat> and then the next thing I'm going to talk about are the light properties of plumage. And how basically that discusses how um, birds uh, get the colors that they get or, or are the colors that they are. Uh, next, I want to talk about putting all those things together, understanding how we see things and then also how birds generate colors and generate um, the plumages that they have and how that can make us, how that can improve our birding skills but also improve conservation efforts. So we'll start out talking about properties of light and light detection. First, now this gets into kind of a trippy area, but you have to realize that color does not exist. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is the, the part that we see as light or visible light or colors is part of a, a larger spectrum in the of electro electromagnetic en energy. Um, so the visible light spectrum that we see as part of that, that electromagnetic energy is what is detected by our eyes. And this is due to evolutionary history, but essentially, if you think about it, <clears throat> in terms of electromagnetic energy, we could have evolved any number of uh, adaptations that could have to, could have um, been developed to detect any number of um, different kinds of electromagnetic energy. It just so happens that our eyes developed to detect light, and the light spectrum, or the or the visible light spectrum, or what we call visible light, um, and it's. Uh, that detection then that is interpreted by our brains as light and color. So, you know, we have to be able to detect a signal and that that signal is transmitted to our brains and that our brains actually interpret that as light or color. And you can see here, this is <clears throat> what the part of the spectrum is for um, electromagnetic energy. And you can see gamma rays are down there, x-rays ultraviolet rays fall just above the, or just above the uh, visible light spectrum there, or actually below. It's got a um, smaller wavelength, uh, or shorter wavelength. And then you, once you get past the very narrow band of visible light, we get into infrared, and then radio waves. And, that, and by comparison, our ears then detect wavelengths in the acoustic range, or the sound range. And you can see here, and I'll, let me throw this up. 
this is the one of the you know the spectrum of electromagnetic energy all the way from cosmic rays down to the subsonic which some animals can detect like um, uh, elephants I believe all right but you can see there's actually a gap in our ability to detect um, different aspects of the electromagnetic like or electro, electromagnetic range and that we see visible light and we pick up sound but we don't pick up infrared light radar television shortwave am fm radio <laughs> those things we can detect using devices but those devices then translate it back into a a, a, a frequency that we can detect so let's look at the properties of a human eye First, the light has to pass through a cornea and a pupil and an iris. Light has to pass through this cornea, through the pupil, into the lens, and the lens then focuses that light back onto the retina, which is back here. And it's that light, once it's focused through onto the retina, it's funneled by Mueller cells, which have only been recently um, described and, and identified for their function and then eventually it's detected by rods and cones. Uh, so here's a more simplified version of this. Again, the light passes through the cornea, uh, through the iris, uh, through the lens, and back onto the retina here. Notice it does not go directly to the optic nerve. All right. And the reason for that is it has to be picked up by these photoreceptor cells. We actually have two main kinds of photoreceptor cells. The first are rods, and these photoreceptor cells, called rods, they're shaped like rods, and they detect light particles, and they convert that stimulus into a chemical and electrical signal that's then transmitted, you know, via the nerve connections through the, into the optic nerve. And with these, these are typically responsible for receiving size, shape, and brightness of objects. And they're typically clustered more to the outer edges of our, of our retina. And this will be, these are useful for um, uh, more for nighttime or low light uh, or, or, or vision. Here's a, an example of a uh, rod and a cone. And here's a rod here on the left and a cone on the right. And you can see they get their name because of the shapes. And then this is a further breakdown of these. I'm not going to go into this great a detail, but this is just sort of give you an idea of what we're looking at. Cones are responsible for color vision and for perceiving more finer details in, in objects. Um, they're much fewer in number than rods, and they're concentrated typically towards the center of the retina. And that makes sense because that's where a lot of the light is being focused into our eye. Uh, and the fovea is just a depression that uh, is in the retina where uh, cones are actually really highly concentrated. Now, the thing to think about is that humans have three kinds of cone cells. And, it's, and we identify these cone cells based on the wavelengths of light that they d detect. We have cone cells for detecting red, blue, and green light. And it's the combination of those, the, the stimulus of those different cones that allow us to perceive color. So for example, the stimulus of red cones with green cones produces a yellow color. Birds have a very much more complex uh, cone system and that they have red, blue, and green, or bl red, blue, green, and cones that are able to detect ultraviolet light. Um, and the thing to think about is that there's actually an evolutionary history there that birds, lizards, fish, and uh, even insects are able to detect ultraviolet light. Um, so humans have, have lost the ability to detect um, ultraviolet light. <laughs> now, <clears throat> As I mentioned, once light passes through the, the lens, it's, it's then projected onto the retina. Well, if you look, here's the direction of light coming into the eye. It actually has to go through the retina, past all these different ganglion cells and things of uh, other neuro, uh, neural cells to before it ever actually hits a rod or a cone. Once it then hits those rods and cones, it then uh, stimulates the bipolar cell, and those bipolar cells send the message back through the ganglion, and then eventually, and here's this sort of very similar diagram, but the light comes in, goes through all these other layers before it ever actually hits a rod or a cone, and then once it hits that rod and cone, 
broader cone. It's then the signal is then transmitted back up to this layer where there are all these nerve fibers that then uh, co uh, converge into the optic nerve. And that's when the signal is finally sent to your brain. Now, as I mentioned, the Mueller cell, which has been more recently identified, acts like a, like a fiber optic cable. And the way it works is that light comes in and it hits that um, Mueller cell, which is on the outside of the, the retina here. And then it breaks that light down into a spectrum. And much more of the green, yellow, and orange or red light gets through and then stimulates the cones. The blue light actually kind of leaks out before it hits the blue cones. So these Mueller cells really are good for transmitting green, yellow, and orange uh, light, um, or red light, I should say, uh, into, uh, those, into those cones. Um, and then the blue light, again, not only is it activating cone cells, but it's also activating the rod cells. All right, so this, that's the way uh, light then gets through those layers of, of additional um, nerve cells that, ha that are come lie before they ever get to the rods and cones. All right. Now, just as a side note, because okay, I always kind of get this when I have this talk, um, some people are actually colorblind. And we we know that, but um, some are also not only colorblind, but they may be or they may be selectively colorblind. For example, a lot of men tend to be red green colorblind. Uh, as you're looking at this uh, particular presentation, hopefully you're seeing a red canary. Um, if you don't, then you may be colorblind. The neat thing, though, is that in just recently here, they've actually started being able to treat red green color blindness. And they've, I've seen um, treatments using um, uh, gene therapy. I've also seen treatments using uh, surgery. But more interestingly, a new uh, company has actually come out, and they've actually developed, uh, they almost look like sunglasses that allow people to be able to see red, green, uh, red, or uh, people who have had red, green, colorblind to be able to see those colors now. And if so, if you do have red, green, colorblind, and you're a birder, and you want to start to see a larger spectrum out there, um, you can go to this website, and I have no affiliation with them, um, but you can actually purchase those glasses to help um, with red, green, colorblindness. Interestingly enough, there are a very small number of people who actually can see in the UV spectrum, and more interesting, or more recently, there was a woman who was an artist, and she actually was capable of seeing in that UV spectrum. And she's a painter, and so using her paintings, she was actually able to give scientists an idea of what it's like to be to be able to see in that UV spectrum range. Um, and I'll explain that because, again, you know, think about the combinations of those red, blues, and greens, and how that produces different colors. Then you add in a fourth color there, and the, the combination of those. Well, real quickly, just as a comparison, this is what a bird's eye looks like. And the bird's eye, again, has the same cornea, uh, pupil, iris, or I'm sorry, iris, uh, pupil, and then eventually the light goes through the lens and gets focused back on this uh, retina. And the same thing, birds have the same sort of structures in terms of the has to pass through the, the retina into the rods and cones. But you'll notice there's this big thing out here, and it's called the pectin. The pectin actually serves two purposes. First is that it provides blood and blood flow through to the optic nerve. The other thing is, is that there's this fluid that fills the uh, eye. And the same thing in humans, it's called the aqueous, or I'm sorry, uh, vitreous humor. And this actually helps regulate the pH of that vitreous humor. Um, with birds, again, most birds have rods and cones. Uh, again, they're going to be more highly concentrated, right, or the cones are going to be more concentrated back here on, the, on this part of the eye. The rods are going to be more com or prominent along these parts of the outer part of the eye. And so as a result, by understanding this, that they have these four, the makeup of the four different cones, we can sort of create a model for what it would be like to be a bird and, and how birds see it. So we've got this, what's called a tetrahedral collar space. And so what we can do is put um, UV or, or what they call ultraviolet or nearviolet light uh, at one end, uh, long wavelengths with this red, 
medium wavelength light, which is green, or short wavelength light, wavelength light, which is blue. And then we can kind of map things. So in some cases, so if you were to follow just this axis and you were to go up this way, about here, birds would see something called ultra blue. Same thing here, ultra, ultra red, ultra green. It's the combination of the ultraviolet with one of these three wavelengths. Now, as I mentioned, if you combine uh, red and green, so here you would see yellow. Oops, let me go back. You would start to see yellow. However, when you add in, if you were to follow up this plane of this, tri or this uh, pyramid, up here you would start to see ultra yellow. So again, you have this combination of these three different things that you can combine into a much wider range of colors than we would typically be able to see ourselves. Well, we can also take this and map plumage colors on this using spectrophotometers so we can get an idea of what birds look like um, to each other based on this, this uh, tetrahedral color space. Now, one of the things to think about is that not all birds can see color or UV. So, for example, owls have much more have many more rods than they do cones. As a result, they see in high contrast black and white, and and that makes sense because in order to see color, you have to have light. Well, at night, there's not that much light. So, in order to be able to see, you want to be able to detect as much light as you can, and it's not going to be able to be broken down. So, you want to be able to see, <coughs> excuse me, sort of high co high contrast. Um, images. Uh, additionally, because they're seeing in black and white and, um, and they have many, many more rods uh, than we do, they are seeing a much finer uh, detailed image than we can see at night. Okay, so we've talked about the properties of light and light detection. I didn't go too far into the, the physics, I hope, um, and, the, and the anatomy, but I would like to talk now a little bit about the light properties of plumage, and some of this you're probably going to be familiar with. Um, but hopefully some of this is going to be new to you. So in order to produce the colors that birds have um, in terms of their, their plumage, there are two major ways that they can achieve this, or that this is actually achieved. One is through pigments, and one is through structural coloration. And I'm going to talk about pigments first. And these pigments typically are producing reds, yellows, oranges, browns, blacks, and those pigments are deposited within the feathers themselves as they grow. And I'll talk about structural colors here in a little bit. So there are four major types of pigments. First are melanins, and these are manufactured from proteins in the bird. And there are two types of these melanins. There's eumelanin and pheomelanin, and I'll break those both down here in a second. Secondly, there are carotenoid pigments, which are acquired from dietary sources. There are porphyrins, which are typically metal-based pigments, and these are related to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, obviously, is the um, material that makes our blood red. Um, and then cetacofulvins, which are unique to parrots alone. So with pigments, let's we'll start to talk about the melanins first. So, so one of the two types of melanins that exist is eumelanin. And eumelanin is responsible for grays and black colorations. And this is, if you can think of it, it's very similar to printer toner. So the more printer toner you lay down, the more black something is. The less toner you lay down, the more gray it is. And if you don't put any melanin out or any toner out, you end up with white. And the same thing occurs with melanin. So we're with eumelanin. So high concentration results in black, like the cap of this uh, black cap, or I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Ooh, getting, yeah, it was a <laughs> gray cat bird. I almost said black cap warbler, and I'm getting my continents confused here. Uh, black cap warbler is a European species, sorry. Um, and then low concentration is responsible for the gray coloration in this cat bird. Um, pheomelanin uh, it kind of is responsible for a range of colors, and really one of the better examples from uh, looking at pheomelanin is uh, actually the wild uh, it's the chicken, the wild chicken, the original ancestor. You know what I'm talking about, though. Okay. Um, and this is actually, this is, what is it? I think that's, uh, that's peacock, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, side discussion here. Um, but this is actually a pheasant that you're looking at here. And it does express some of the um, colors that are, are produced by pheomelon. So red, 
kind of a reddish rust color, uh, and, and then golds and yellows. The other type of pigment, or the, the, the combination of those two pigments, those two melanins together, can help produce a wide range of, of colors. And so, for example, uh, if you combine eumelanin with pheomelanin, you may get this rusty color like we see in this uh, brown thrasher, but it can also produce the dark chocolate that we see in golden eagles. Um, and so that's, that's the thing to think about. Another thing is with melanins, and particularly with eumelanin, um, they provide uh, more strength to, to feathers. Um, so typically with birds that have uh, eumelanin in their feathers are going to be doing a lot of um, uh, things that, that would result in feather wear. So another source of pigments are these carotenoids. And again, I, I mentioned that these were obtained from uh, dietary sources. And, and they're typically obtained from things like insects, seeds, berries, shell, shellfish, or some of the, the various uh, environmental sources for carotenoids, and they're responsible for things like reds, pinks, oranges, and yellows in plumage. Now, there are two ways of incorporating car uh, carotenoid pigments in plumage. The first is by unalter you know, directly ingesting them and then through metabolic processes, directly depositing them within the feathers, being completely unaltered as they are deposited. The other way is by ingesting them, and then they go through a metabolic process that causes them to be altered, and then they're deposited with yellow or red. So for example, with a carotenoid pigment that passes unaltered from the diet of, to feathers, and one of the examples of, these, of a um, carotenoid pigment is canary xanthophyll, and it's a yellow pigment, and the bird ingests that pigment and deposits it directly into its plumage as a yellow pigment. And this is the, what would we see in waxwings. And we know this because in some cases, waxwings will ingest a, um, another source of pigment, or another source of, uh, of uh, carotenoid pigment called rhodoxanthin. And it's more of a reddish color, and they get this from an invasive uh, honeysuckle berry. When they ingest that rhodoxanthin, or that, that the honeysuckle berry, that rhodoxanthin then gets passed into their plumage, and it is expressed as an orange plumage, or orange color. And you can see that here in the tail of, of this particular uh, specimen here. Um, so if you look at the tails here, you can see this one was eating normal food, and this one was eating something laced with rhodoxanthin, and that that carotenoid actually got deposited in the tail as an orange pigment. Oh, okay, okay. Well, let's try that. Okay, so if I click in here, okay. Sure. I'm still learning this. I, this <laughs> We're still learning the uh, technical stuff here. Okay, okay. Now then, so uh, another thing is, so I mentioned that the rhodoxan, or the, I'm sorry, the xanthophyll, the yellow pigment, can get passed unaltered through uh, the diet, or the me metabolic process and be deposited in feathers. Well, some red and orange pigments are also passed that way, and we can think of that in terms of things like flamingos or ibises, or the um, roseate uh, spoonbill, I'm sorry. Well, and some ibises, um, but they can de ingest uh, shellfish, which contain uh, either canthoxanthin, astaxanthin, or phenicoxanthin. Uh, all of these are found in either algae or shellfish. In fact, algae will oftentimes be ingested by the shellfish, and then that, that pigment is then ingested by the uh, bird, and those then are deposited directly into the uh, feathers unaltered. Now, where it gets tricky is that in some cases these birds can ingest a yellow pigment and through alteration produce the same sort of red coloration and it's broken down and changed through a metabolic process. Um, now you'd think with a bird like a canary, or I'm sorry, with the American goldfinch here, that they would be eating something that has a yellow pigment and that that same yellow pigment would just be directly um, deposited in their feathers. Except that what they've actually found is that when birds, when when um, goldfinches eat um, something with a yellow pigment, it actually is passed through their digestive system in through through a metabolic process. And what happens is that 
that metabolic process actually amplifies and increases the brightness of the yellow. So it actually is modifying that yellow pigment and then depositing it within the uh, feathers of the bird. So that's why the yellow of a goldfinch looks much more different than the yellow of a um, cedar waxwing, for example. <coughs> Excuse me. And the same thing happens with cardinals. Cardinals will actually ingest a yellow pigment. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. They will ingest a yellow pigment, and then they actually pass that yellow pigment through their metabolic process, and it converts into a red pigment. And so that's how cardinals become red, even though they may be eating some of the same seeds or food sources as, say, goldfinches. Porphyrins are another type of um, pigment. And these are, again, these are the ones that are related to hemoglobin, which is what we have in our blood cells. Um, and there are several types, and in, at least in birds, the ones that are responsible for color are typically copper-based. Um, and again, as I mentioned, hemoglobin is what we have in our blood. Hemoglobin actually is iron-based. So it's a molecule of iron surrounded by other types of uh, molecules. Um, and these porphyrins are responsible for reds, greens, and then some shades of uh, browns and rusts. Um, so for example, here we have a uh, eastern screech owl, red phase eastern screech owl that actually has, that has a type of porphyrin in it. There are three kind, major types of porphyrins. One is terosin, which we have in, um, only in Taracos and only within the family Muscophagidae. Uh, and they are responsible for this red crest that we see on this uh, Lady Ross's Taraco. Now what's interesting about this type of um, uh, porphyrin or this particular type of pigment is unlike many other kinds of pigments, it is potentially soluble in, an, in a dilute alkaline solution, so a basic solution. And that it will actually come out into the, the solution. And so it can be used for other purposes and it's been used by some indigenous groups to, as a dye or you know, things of that nature. Um, this is a group of birds that's only found within Africa. Another source of, of uh, porphyrin, or another type of porphyrin, is the Taraco veritin, and these are responsible for greens. Now, unlike the Taracin, which is found in the Lady Ross's Taraco, this is actually found in a number of different species, including this uh, white-eared Taraco. Um, again, found in Africa, but also in, in uh, Jacanas, and also crested wood partridge. Um, and these are derived from copper rich, uh, typically a copper rich diet, so they can be um, things that the bird is eating that has copper in them, so fruits, flowers, and buds of, of uh, plants. Then there is this other group called natural porphyrins, and these are the things that are responsible for some of the speckling and browns and colors uh, that we see in eggshells. But the other thing that's interesting is that they are found in plumages, and so for example with owls, um, goat suckers, so the night hawks and things of that nature, um, and then also juvenile uh, or juvenile black shoulder and white tailed kites, they actually have natural porphyrins and that's what gives them this, gives at least owls that kind of rusty brown natural speckling uh, look appearance to them. Sataka so fulvans, we don't get many um, parrot species in Ohio, uh, but these are a source of red, orange, and yellows in parrots. And actually, what's interesting about this is that a researcher here from uh, Ohio at Ohio Wesleyan named uh, Jed Burt uh, found that the interesting thing about these uh, pigments is that they help uh, birds, or the feathers at least, resist feather degrading bacteria. So the higher concentration that of Sataka fulvans in the feather, the less uh, subject they are to degradation by um, bacteria, which if you think about where parrots live in those hot, moist, warm climates where you might have a lot of bacterial activity, it's good to have those pigments then that help protect the feathers and uh, reduce feather wear on them. So now that we've talked about the pigmented colors, let's talk a little bit about structural colors. And with structural colors, there's kind of three main types. There's white, non-iridescent, and iridescent. The, the way these um, colors are produced is through light interacting with these little microstructures within the feathers. And the microstructures act like either um, maybe like little tiny bubbles or little crystals within the feather structure. Um, and they, they basically reflect and refract and, and help light be absorbed uh, or amplified by the feather structure. 
and these are made from a keratin protein. And that, that particular point is important because I'll, I'll make a comparison later on. So white, so the microstructures, what ends up happening is that as light passes through the microstructures, it's scattered in all directions and all wavelengths equally. And that then comes back to our eye as being white. Um, it's basically reflecting the white or the light back to us without breaking it down into its component um, spectrum. And this is also why we see white clouds, for example. Um, the water molecules in a cloud helps reflect and, and refract and, and bounce all those wavelengths of light back to our eye equally, and as a result, the clouds appear white. So structural colors that produce non-iridescence or unglossy structural colors, because you can have the same colors that are non-iridescent as you can as iridescent. So it's important to point out these are the non-glossy ones. But the thing about these non-iridescent colors is that they're really restricted to short wavelength, uh, the short wavelength spectrum. So things like violet, indigo, blue, and ultraviolet. Um, and what happens is these are a result of the microstructures found in the feather barbs themselves. And, and, and so you see this in blue jays, uh, eastern bluebirds, um, and a variety of other um, types of species. But here you can see a, a breakdown of the feather structure. And you can see, let me point it out just so we're on the same boat here. But what we see is once we take the, this particular part of the, the um, uh, the rachis of the feather, and we take this little subsection and pull it out, we can see that there's the barb, which are these main shafts that come off the rachis, and then there are the little barbules, which are the little tiny more feathered parts, or the little teeth on those uh, barbs. Okay? Pardon me. Okay, let me go back to the pointer. There we go. So it's in the, what did I do? got to click on the thing. So it's um, the barbs then that are producing these iridescent, non-iridescent colors, or the microstructures within the barbs. By comparison, oh I'm sorry, let me get my, <laughs> I get all confused here once I start changing clickers. Okay, um, so again as I mentioned, um, the non-iridescent colors are a result of microstructures within the barbs and they're responsible for things like violet, indigo, blue, and ultraviolet. Well, you probably are familiar with some birds that have blue um, parts of the flesh uh, or, or bare parts of their or their uh, their body that are blue, and the thing essentially it's the same thing happening as in the feathers. <coughs> but what it is is instead of um, being produced by keratin, it's actually being produced by a different kind of protein called collagen. So, for example, in grackles, one of the things that we found or I found is that um, the nictitating membrane, which you can see closed over the eye here, does reflect in the ultraviolet range. Uh, and it's a result of that co that collagen uh, scattering the wavelengths and reflecting um, ultraviolet light in, uh, uh, back to your eye. Now, uh, these non-iridescent colors, they can combine with carotenoid pigments. So remember of those pigments that are being ingested um, from some sort of dietary source and being laid down as yellow, orange, or red. When we combine those ear, those uh, uh, pigmented colors with a structural color, we can actually end up with green. And so we can see here this green um, bird is actually a result of uh, a combination of a yellow pigment with a blue structural color. Now let's talk about the iridescent colors. Okay, now these are produced by these thin layers of light transmitting uh, materials within the barbules. Now think back, we showed the barbs, and the barbules were, were even the smaller part. And what happens is the light is reflected through the layers at different speeds. And so when you, it, it's kind of like a um, bubble of oil, uh, and you can see that rainbow effect on a bubble of oil. And what happens is, is that the, some light goes through the bubble of oil and is reflected back at a slower speed, and at the same time, light is hitting the surface of the bubble and is also being reflected back. And what happens is, what you see are these wavelengths that are either in phase, and then um, they, you see some sort of a color, or they're out of phase and you don't see anything. 
And so in this particular bird here, this particular pigeon, the the light that you're, the iridescent color that you're seeing is a result of where you're standing and what light is being um, passed back to your eye in phase. So depending on what you're looking at, you may see red um, iridescence, you may see green iridescence, you see blue iridescence. When that bird shifts, you may not see that iridescent image or that those colors at all. Again, the iridescent colors are a result of things that are in the barbule, the little microstructures that are within the, within the barbules of the feather, so even uh, smaller uh, structures. So in iridescence, it's the in-phase wavelengths are actually amplified. So that's why with a hummingbird, like this ruby-throated hummingbird, you see this red because at that particular angle that those feathers are, are, are uh, oriented towards you, the, the light that's being reflected back to your eye is all in phase in a red wavelength. The rest of the light is either being passed through or absorbed. And, and the neat thing about these struct or these iridescent colors or these iridescent structures is that they can really produce any range of colors. <coughs> They're not limited the way pigments are or the way um, those other structural colors are. Okay, so I've gone through and talked about how our light, our eyes perceive light, how birds perceive light, and then how birds uh, view each other, how they appear to each other as a result of their plumage. So let's put this together for better birding. So we can understand a bird's brain, or by understanding a bird's brain and how it interprets visual signals from the environment and how their plumage appears to members of their own species, we can improve our skills as a birder. And what I really want you to start doing is really thinking like a bird. So that when you see um, something in the environment or you see a bird, think about how does that bird appear to other birds as a result of your knowledge that, that you gain from um, how they uh, put down their color and how they uh, see the world. So for example, with great horned owls, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, we know that they have nocturnal vision, so as a result they have this high contrast black and white image that they see. Additionally, they have this dark plumage which is primarily uh, comprised of natural porphyrins and melanins, except that they have this white throat patch. And when they're not vocalizing, that white throat patch is usually hidden. But when they are vocalizing, which means they are communicating to other members of their species, they, that white throat patch is visible. So, or visible. So if you think about at night, when you have two great horned owls at a far distance who can see it at very um, high resolution black and white imaging, that white throat patch all of a sudden stands out. So a, a bird that would use something like this, so a white throat patch or white, um, some sort of white patch that has high contrast black and white ima or imaging, that's when you may want to not wear a white t-shirt. Okay, because this, and what the problem is, is that it, it keys in, the spur keys in on white as a threat or a communication from another member with species. And as a result, it's being keyed up to either defend territory or to uh, have some sort of interaction with another member of its species. Well, this results in higher stress hormone levels. And so as a result, if you're wearing white, it may perceive that white as a threat, and as a result, you know, cause, the streets, uh, cause these stress for the species um, and, and cause a lot of problems. So as a result, that's when you, like I said, that's when you don't want to wear a white t-shirt. Now. For a lot of other birds, especially diurnal birds, who do see color, they're probably seeing the color of your clothing. The pro or, I'm sorry, the color of your clothing really isn't going to matter much because they can see it so well. Um, typically, even anything you wear, even camouflage, is going to be highly visible to a bird because of the way they see. They can pick up those ultraviolet colors uh, really well. They can see combinations of those ultra colors. So what we see as camo may actually not be camouflaged at all to a bird. Not only that, but most of the laundry detergents that we use nowadays, they have these chemical components called optical brighteners. And what that does is it actually puts down a UV fluorescing material into your clothing. And it, so your clothing, even though it may not be clean, it appears to be clean. Um, well, birds can see that. So it really doesn't matter what you wear um, because you're going to be visible to a bird. Um, how that or how you can use that I'm sorry how you can use that knowledge to improve your birding skills is 
rather than worrying about what you're wearing, worry about how you're behaving around a bird. As long as you're not making a lot of noise, you're not um, trying to approach a bird too closely or anything like that, that's when, or if you do decide to approach a bird closely, you know, move slowly in, in a non-threatening manner and really watch the behavior of the bird so that, you know, if it's showing stress signals, which you can typically interpret, then then you want to um, adjust your behavior. But the bird's going to see you coming regardless. Okay. Now, the neat thing, though, is that you can use this knowledge of how birds see the world to improve habitat in your backyard. And so one of the things you should think about is, choosing native plants. And the reason I say this is, as I mentioned earlier, um, some non-native plants like invasive honeysuckle um, sometimes carry pigments that birds don't usually adjust, um, like the rhododendron. But uh, native plants, most of our native plants actually possess or contain xanthophyll, that yellow pigment that most of our native birds ingest and incorporate into their feathers. Um, one of the other things to think about is, as I mentioned, if you can get an understanding of how birds view the world, you start to see the red fruiting plants um, or things that have red fo foliage um, typically are things that are going to stand out to birds. And the reason is they've actually found that um, with uh, red fo or red fruit or red foliage, that stands out from a farther distance against a green background as opposed to, say, a black um, fruit or something of that nature, okay? I hope that makes sense. So essentially red is a very high contrast color against a green background as opposed to black against a green background. And they've actually done some experimental studies uh, where they've offered black fruits on green backgrounds and red fruits green, on green backgrounds to different birds and then see how long it takes them from a certain distance to detect those, those berries. And they've actually found that birds can see red fruit or, or release red signals from a much further distance than they can at uh, other sources. Uh, and it's because of that contrast. Now some plants will actually use a UV reflective coating or a waxy coating that reflects UV light to help attract birds as well. So for example, grapes, if you think about a grape and you go into a store and you rub off a, the, the waxy coating on a grape, that waxy coating is not something that they spray on the grape. It's actually a natural waxy coating and that's, it actually reflects UV, at least in wild grapes. Um, and in Virginia creeper, the Virginia creeper berries, it uses a combination of things in that it uses high contrasting red foliage um, as well as uh, waxy coating on the berries to help attract birds. Now, in order to help um, some of your birds also, now that you understand how birds see the, the world, you can understand why sometimes they hit glass objects or, gla or windows. Um, and so what you want to think about doing is trying to use a re UV reflective uh, uh, material on your window so that the birds can see it more adequately. Now they've actually shown studies where, for example, those um, the hawk stickers, the hawk stickers alone are not sufficient enough to keep a bird from hitting your window. You actually need to, to um, space those hawk stickers all over the window about two to three inches apart, I think is is the way it works. Um, but what you can do is there are, there are yellow, or UV uh, coatings out there that you can put on your window. And most of the time those UV coatings are going to be clear. And this will help make your window a little bit more visible. Additionally, if you think about the fact that birds are, again, seeing in those highly contrasting colors, um, they see the combinations of ultraviolet with other kinds of colors, you can try using various colored strips of material um, spaced across your window and see if that doesn't help um, keep window or keep birds from, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, colliding with them as well. Or you can use some sort of material, you know, you can place objects uh, in front of your windows or something like that on the inside of your house that may also have real bright colors. Okay, so conclusions. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great. Okay. Um, bird vision is similar but very different from our own. And so, you know, we have to get out of the habit of looking at something and thinking, oh, this looks great, because to a bird, it may not look so great. Uh, bird plumage colors result from a variety of different sources, and they serve a variety of different purposes. Additionally, bird plumage colors convey a lot of information that we don't fully understand yet. Um, what I didn't get into here is that um, those different pigments, 
and those different structural colors and the combinations of those different things um, vary across ages and sexes of birds. And so they are actually communicating with one another visually when they look at one another and there are there's messages in those feathers or in those plumages that we really don't understand just looking at a bird on its own. We can kind of guess, we can kind of take, um, get an idea of what we're seeing, but we don't fully understand that. Um, additionally, being a good bird isn't just about what, you're, uh, what you wear or your ability to identify a bird. Um, all too often I think we emphasize um, identification and we really need to start looking at birds on the whole as, as a um, entity and, and getting to understand not only ident their field marks, but how do they behave, um, where do they live, what do they eat, how do they um, interact with the environment that they're in. And you can really improve your, your skills as a birder by really going and exploring things much further in depth and, and understanding the science of birds, which is called ornithology. You can do this by taking classes at your local you know, college. You can do this by um, reading more in-depth science-related books. Um, additionally, um, there are conferences like the Ohio Avian Research Conference in October that you can attend and interact directly more with the scientists who are um, helping further our knowledge of birds. Um, and so, for example, again, this Ohio Avian Research Conference uh, is coming up in Saturday, or Saturday, October 17th at Denison University. Um, you can contact me for more details about that if you're interested in attending. And I can also send you information about uh, conferences from the last two years. And with that, here's a, most of the information I got out of today's book with regard to um, some of those plumages came from this book. Um, and so if you are interested in, in really exploring more in depth in the science of <coughs> birds vision and plumage, this is a good resource that I would uh, to suggest you to start with. And then lastly, here's my contact information for anybody who um, is interested. Well, thank you so much, Daisy. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. I hope everyone else did as well. And um, with that, I'd like to open it up um, to questions and see. Um, go ahead and enter those in your chat box, your question box, and um, I will forward those here on um, to Casey. But um, also, I wanted to just mention briefly, Casey talked about um, solutions to try to prevent window collisions at your home. We have a lot more information about that at our website, which I'll put here um, in our chat box, cinet.org. So if you have any questions, um, I urge you to take a look at our resources for, for preventing collisions at home, and also you can email me at any time, and Casey's information is here as well. And if you have any interest in um, ornithology and birds, I do highly recommend um, the conference Casey mentioned. Um, do you want to put it back on that if you Sure. Let me so. see. Oops, there, there we go. There we go. Um, just so you have that information for you. Um, so go ahead and enter if you have any questions. And um, I had a, a question quickly just to get things started. Um, you mentioned um, some stress signals that birds might display to show that they're stressed. Mm -hmm. Can you give any examples of that so people might be able to recognize those in the field? Sure. The first one is that they start to look around a lot. Um, they go from a relaxed posture and they start to look around their environment a lot more and they start to um, move their head about. Um, another really good sign that a bird is stressed that it actually defecates. And if it defecates, that's a really clear indication that it's getting ready to, to take off. Um, <clears throat> so those are two, two major things. Um, also, you'll notice in posture, a lot of times birds will go from sort of a um, uh, relaxed posture to all of a sudden they're kind of more upright. And as a result of that, you can, you know, I mean, that's basically an indication that, okay, I've noticed you, I'm getting into a position where I may need to either fight or fly. And so that's, those are kind of three big indicators that a bird might be stressed. So we have a question coming in here from Autumn. It says, is sexual dimorphism caused by pigment strength, pigment alteration, or structure? Um, that's actually a good question, and it's, it actually, sexual dimorphism act, can contribute to those things, but it's not necessarily caused by those things. 
Um, so for example, let's see, let me read the question one more time. Sure. It's actually a little more some help by picking the string, picking the alteration or structure. Yeah, so any number of things can cause um, sexual dimorphism. Um, typically, a bird is going to be sexually dimorphic to begin with. It can be the sexual selection. It can be due to natural selection. Um, and then that then contributes to whether or not they're going to have different structural colors or they're going to have different pigment colors um, in their system. And again, hormones also plays a big part of it. So the difference between a male and a female bird uh, um, can be the, the coloration can be drastically affected by hormone levels as well. Great. We have a question from Robert Scott asking, what color should we use for hummingbird feeders? Ah, that's a great question. Um, typically a hummingbird feeder, if you buy it from the store, is going to have a red base and a clear top. That is more than sufficient for attracting hummingbirds. Um, there's a state park, I want to say it's Lake Hope, Lake Hope. So, State Park, where they've done a really interesting experiment. They actually, this is a place where you can actually go and hand feed hummingbirds here in Ohio. Um, and it typically occurs, I think, June through August. Um, one of the things that they found is that um, you can actually, they, they painted their hummingbird feeders black. And in spite of that, the hummingbirds still are coming to the feeders. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I would discourage you from trying is adding red food coloring to the water. That's, that's an old uh, traditional um, aspect or traditional practice. And one of the reasons that they discourage that is even though there hasn't been any studies that have shown a whole lot of um, problems with those red food coloring, the red food coloring uh, uh, is oil-based or it's, it's petroleum-based, and so they think it could contribute to carcinogenic factors. Um, there hasn't been a lot of studies on the effects of red food coloring on birds, but that they, it's more of a precautionary step. And one of the things I actually want to try and experiment with this summer is that there are sources of natural red dye. Um, and one of the sources is actually, <laughs> it's actually from a um, parasitic beetle species, or I'm sorry, insect species um, in, in Peru. And what they do is they actually collect these insects and they dry them out and then they crush them. And when they crush them, it creates this red dye. Um, and it's called, oh, I just ordered it from Amazon and I can't remember it, Car or Carmine or, what's the other name for it? There's another name for it. I can't think of it. it email me and I'll tell you. But I, one of the things I'm going to try this summer is seeing if there's any effect uh, or how that um, natural red dye affects um, food coloring and if, the, if there's any difference in attraction between different feeders uh, with that natural red dye. And Scott, uh, Robert also asked what about other food colors in hummingbird water, but essentially they're all detrimental. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're all petroleum-based. Um, you know, there, like I said, there are natural organic um, food colorings out there. Um, you may want to check to see what those are based on. This, the, the, the reason I want to try this particular red dye is, again, it's insect-based. And insects are something that, you know, hummingbirds will eat. They eat fruit flies and things like that. So I want to see if, if that has any effect on, on um, their attraction. But it's not at all necessary. It's not necessary. I, one of the things, and again, I don't know if this has been looked at or not, is what are the optical property, properties of sugar water? <laughs> you know, yeah, does true. the sugar water, and I, again, I haven't looked at the research behind this, but does sugar water produce you know, some sort of ultraviolet reflection that we don't see, that a bird does see, and that's why they're coming to those black feeders of right. Lake Hope. How interesting. So. Um, I have a question, another one here from Autumn. How or why do green lasers deter waterfowl? Uh, that's a good question. And I don't fully know the science behind it. I know that they do. Um, but at the same time, green laser pointers have been used in the tropics um, very frequently because the, the green stands out. Um, and that they're used by uh, bird guides in the tropics. Mm -hmm. And so they can actually use the, the laser to help point to a bird you know, in the jungle where it's a lot harder to see and it doesn't seem to affect the birds down there. So I don't know exactly why you know, green laser pointers deter, you know, they may see it as a, as a, I don't know, some sort of an object or something, but it's again yeah. something that they're detecting that we can't detect. Right, and I think I've seen that um, used over like solar 
the old places where mm -hmm. they don't want birds to land, maybe toxic ponds. It might just be that yeah, they can I, detect that there's something there. Right, and I heard that they're actually using it here in Columbus on the um, Scioto River down on Fifth Avenue. Really? The dam, when they did a restoration project down there, they, they removed the dam and they're trying to restore vegetation. Mm -hmm. And they're having a real oh. difficult problem with um, geese coming in and removing the emergent vegetation. And it's just not getting a foothold. So they've tried, if you go down there, you drive down there, you'll see uh, um, streamers, ropes with streamers and things like that. But I also understand that they're using um, green lasers hmm. um, to try to deter geese from roosting there. Interesting. Any other questions I can answer? Got about another minute left, so get your questions in before we wrap up. Again, today's webinar was recorded, and that will be sent um, to you in a link, and also to those who registered but were unable to attend. But if you um, hopefully really enjoyed today's presentation and would like to share it with everyone, I, uh, with anyone, I encourage you to forward that along, and also um, sign up as well to get. Um, a monthly um, email about what our upcoming topic will be, and you can sign up for that also at our website, obcinet.org, which is posted in the chat. And again, we will not be having a webinar in May, but um, I showed you those topics that are coming up, a lot of really great, interesting topics having to do with um, recreation, with um, agriculture and birds. And um, the topic coming up here in June is birds nesting in the oak openings. So I hope that you will return and join us um, for that presentation, for those presentations as well. And um, just as a final reminder, um, please take a moment to either email me or complete um, the survey on our new webinar service. Um, this is a paid service, so before we make the investment, we want to make sure that everyone um, is able to access it and enjoys um, the presentation. So hopefully it, it worked out a little better for all of you and we didn't have any um, technical issues. But if you did, I definitely want to hear from you either way. So thank you again, Casey, for um, presenting. I, I really enjoyed our presentation today. I'm sure folks out here did as well. And hopefully I will see all of you on an upcoming webinar. I don't know that. Oh, that's actually a good question. Yeah. Uh,